Today, I would like to discuss a group of grenades that would have contained a, a combustible substance. These grenades are recovered in quantities from sites known to have been under siege, dating from the 10th to 12th century AD. Many of these sites are from Syro-Palestine, although some are from the broader Byzantine cultural sphere. It's very difficult to identify with certainty what culture would have made any particular vessel on a site, although if you have a group of vessels, some broad relationships can be drawn. They may or may not relate to what we now understand to be Greek fire. Greek fire particularly is known for being projected out of tubes, much like a modern flamethrower, and Greek fire played a very important role in repelling invasions of Constantinople in the 7th century AD. However, before discussing this evidence, I would like to go back further and discuss some of the earliest uses of flame weapons in archaeology. While no doubt not the first group to use flame weapons, it is known from artistic representations that the Assyrians used flame weapons by the 9th century BC. The Romans were also familiar with flame weapons. Julius Africanus, writing in the 3rd century AD, records a very complicated mixture prepared under exacting conditions in order to create a fire that, as he describes, will ignite when the sun comes up. I'll read the recipe briefly. Take equal amounts of sulfur, rock salt, ashes, thunderstone, and pyrite, and pound fine in a black mortar at the midday sun. Also, equal amounts of each ingredient mixed together black mulberry resin and zacinthian asphalt, the latter in a liquid form and free-flowing, resulting in a product that is sooty colored. Then add to the asphalt the tiniest amount of quicklime. But because the sun is at its zenith, one must pound it carefully to protect the face, for it will ignite suddenly. When it catches fire, one should seal it in some sort of copper receptacle. In this way, you will have it available in a box without exposing it to the sun. If you would wish to ignite enemy armaments, you will smear it on in the evening, either on the armaments or some other object, but in secret. When the sun comes up, everything will be burnt up. Clearly, this has a lot to do with alchemistry and perhaps less to do with chemistry. And perhaps the most important ingredient here would be the quicklime. It's unclear here how much the writer actually understood of what he was doing. It's clear that the sun being in the correct position was important. And it's also clear that there seems to be some kind of energy being absorbed from the sun that is then released at a later time. For a non-modern person, this is a way of explaining a chemical reaction. Does this have much to do with Greek fire? Well, the representations of Greek fire are different, but it is likely Greek fire used some of the same ingredients. Ancient flaming weapons today have been reconstructed using sulfur, petroleum, and bitumen. The fact that we do not know the exact mixtures of materials used at this time is not particularly surprising because it was regarded as a state secret. It was an important aspect of defending the Byzantine Empire, and it is unclear 
if other people beside the Byzantines had the technology to project fire using tubes like a flamethrower. However, it is very clear that other peoples, including their oftentimes enemies, the Arabs, used grenades that were loaded with a similar material. It is possible that Byzantine enemies used Greek fire as well, but perhaps did not understand how to project it. The Emperor Constantine Por Porphyrogenitus, in his, in his book, reminds his son, Romanos II, never to reveal the secrets of the composition of Greek fire, as it was, quote, shown and revealed by an angel to the great and holy first Christian Emperor Constantine. It's clear here, again, that there is an aspect of religion and mysticism associated with the making and use of Greek fire. Of course, fire has important biblical associations in the destruction of evil. And perhaps from here, we can move on to looking at some of the grenades. This is a grenade dating to the 10th or 12th century, and similar grenades have been found all throughout Syro-Palestine, as well as Anatolia. As you can see, these figures might be crosses. It is quite likely that this very large grenade was used by Byzantines in their sieges. What's also clear is that the size of this grenade would probably factor against it being used as a throwing weapon, at least by the arm, but they could have been packed into uh, machinery that could have been used to throw these great distances. It's also clear from the filling hole here that it's unlikely that the mixture would have been either very viscous or perhaps a powdery. It's likely that it would have been a fairly liquid mixture that could have been easily poured into such a small vessel through the tiny feeding hole. Here's another example of a grenade and they all seem to have the same fabric. It's not a simple pottery fabric. It's a more robust fabric. It's almost a stoneware in this case that would have been impermeable. Here's another example, very small, and of course almost anyone would be able to throw this vessel. Whereas, if you compare it to the largest size vessel, you see the size difference. In fact, it would seem this would be more of a weapon for shock and awe, whereas this could actually do some damage. It's difficult to tell with these weapons how, how effectively they could have been thrown, particularly because we don't know how they would have landed and caught something on fire. Would they have been lit uh, when they would have been thrown? Or would they have just been a material that could have been lit later during a siege? There are many questions having to deal with these grenades that are completely unknown because the nature of Greek fire is so unclear to us today. Perhaps there are some secrets that remain from antiquity that we'll never know. Thank you very much.